Examine the following propositions. 1. The mind is a non-physical substance. 2. The universe is made of one substance. 3. The visible world is not real. 4. If you believe in deity X, you will be rewarded, but if you do not believe in deity X, you will be punished. And 5. Everything is designed by a creator for a purpose. Now examine these propositions. 1. Santa Claus is approximately 350 pounds. 2. Unicorns have a maximum horn length of 10 inches. 3. All leprechauns know at least 500 dance routines. 4. Galaxies are really giant eggs frying on a cosmic pan. And 5. The immune system consists of billions of microscopic Chuck Norrises. Bacteria and viruses are also microscopic Chuck Norrises, so regardless of illness or health, Chuck Norris wins. What are the differences between the first and second set of propositions? It would be safe to assume that most people of sound mind would dismiss the second set of propositions entirely without much thought. The same could not be said about the first set of propositions, as philosophers have been debating over them since the dawn of philosophy itself. What these two sets of propositions do have in common, however, is that they are metaphysical propositions. Making a metaphysical claim implies that one has knowledge of a reality that transcends the senses. And even though a metaphysical proposition such as the mind is separate from the body may seem more reasonable than the proposition that galaxies are really giant eggs frying on a cosmic pan, the fact remains that we cannot derive real knowledge from such propositions as they are unverifiable and, as A.J. Ayer would have us believe, are literally nonsensical as a result. In his essay, The Elimination of Metaphysics, Ayer suggests that if we are to consider philosophy as a legitimate branch of knowledge, it must be separated from metaphysics. He writes, The traditional disputes of philosophy are, for the most part, as unwarranted as they are unfruitful. The surest way to end them is to establish beyond question what should be the purpose and method of philosophical inquiry. Traditionally, attacks on metaphysical claims are directed at how such claims come into being. For example, if I claim that leprechauns know at least 500 dance routines, a reasonable response would question how I came to know such a thing if I did not in some way perceive it through my senses. Ayer describes how this objection might be met. The objection would be met by a denial on the part of the metaphysician that his assertions were ultimately based on the evidence of his senses. He would say that he was endowed with a faculty of intellectual intuition which enabled him to know facts that could not be known through sense experiences. A good example of this would be Descartes' ontological argument for the existence of God. As objections to how metaphysical knowledge comes into being can be met with a version of, oh, I have special mental powers, it becomes necessary to criticize the actual statements themselves. We need only to formulate a criterion which enables us to test whether a sentence expresses a genuine proposition about a matter of fact, and then point out that the sentences under consideration fail to satisfy it, Ayer says. The criterion Ayer proposes we use is a criterion of verifiability. A statement can be factually significant only if its author knows how to verify it. We all believe things which we have not taken the steps to verify. I have not been to Iceland, for example, and I have not taken the steps to empirically verify its existence, for it is not practical for me to invest a large sum of money in this endeavor. That said, I would never make the claim that Iceland does not exist because I haven't been there, as its existence could be verified provided I have the proper resources. This is why Ayer identifies the importance of distinguishing practical verifiability from verifiability in principle. Practical verifiability refers to statements or observations that can be readily confirmed or falsified. For example, if I stated that if you stand in the rain, you will get wet, you could easily verify this through direct observation or experience. Verifiability in principle refers to statements that could be hypothetically verified through experience, though not in a practical way. Ayer uses the example of the proposition that there are mountains on the dark side of the moon. He says, No rocket has yet been invented which would enable me to go and look at the farther side of the moon so that I am unable to decide the matter by the actual observation. But I do know that what observations would decide it for me if, as it is theoretically conceivable, that I were once in a position to make them. And therefore, I say that the proposition is verifiable in principle, if not in practice, and is accordingly significant. To put it another way, I can see the moon. Based off of my observations of other celestial objects, I know that the moon is not one-sided. I also know from observation that other planets and moons have mountains. 
though it is not technically practical for me to make direct observations of the dark side of the moon to confirm whether or not mountains are present, it is theoretically possible for me to do so if I were given access to specific technology. So even if someone claims there are mountains on the far side of the moon without actually having observed them, the claim is still verifiable in principle, for the moon can still be perceived by the senses. Ayer also distinguishes between strong and weak verifiability. He says, A proposition is said to be verifiable in the strong sense of the term if and only if its truth could conclusively be established in experience but it is verifiable in the weak sense if it is possible for experience to render it probable. Uh, for example, Mars is a planet in our solar system is an example of a strong verifiable statement because it can be proved correct through observation. An example of weak verifiability would be, it rained yesterday. We cannot look back in time to directly d observe yesterday's rain, yet empirical evidence can render the event highly probable. Between strong and weak verifiability, Ayer proposes that weak verifiability is a better criterion for criticizing metaphysical claims. With strong verifiability, it is too easy to lapse into metaphysical statements. If I said that human beings cannot fly without mechanical assistance, and claimed that this statement was strongly verifiable, I would be saying that the statement is true in an infinite number of cases. The problem here is that I have only observed a finite amount of cases on which to base this statement, and I cannot verify if this statement is true in an infinite number of cases, thus the statement becomes literally nonsensical. I can only say that the truth of my statement can be, at most, probable. Ayer says, accordingly, we fall back on the weaker sense of verification. We say that the question that must be asked about any putative statement of fact is not, would any observations make its truth or falsehood logically certain, but simply, would any observations be relevant to the determination of its truth or falsehood? And it is only if a negative answer is given to the second question that we conclude that the statement under consideration is nonsensical. Ayer uses the idea that the world of sense experience is unreal as an example. It is plain that no conceivable observation or series of observations could have any tendency to show that the world revealed to us by sense experience was unreal. Consequently, anyone who condemns the sensible world as a world of mere appearance, as opposed to reality, is saying something which, according to our criterion of significance, is literally nonsensical. The practice of ascribing attributes to things can also lead to metaphysical traps. Ayer uses the phrases, dogs are faithful and unicorns are fictitious as examples. In order for dogs to be faithful, they must exist. Similarly, in order for unicorns to be fictitious, they must exist in some way, which makes the statement self-contradictory. Ayer clarifies, but as it is plainly self-contradictory to say that fictitious objects exist, the device is adopted of saying that they are real in some non-empirical sense, that they have a mode of real being which is different from the mode of being of existent things. But since there is no way of testing whether an object is real in this sense, as there is for testing whether it is real in the ordinary sense, the assertion that fictitious objects have a special non-empirical mode of real being is devoid of all literal meaning. In other words, statements of non-existence can be just as nonsensical as metaphysical statements of existence. Even if all metaphysical statements are to be considered as literal nonsense, Ayer proposes that they still have value, but only as emotional or moral inspirations, or literary works of art. Ayer is careful, however, to avoid asserting that works produced by artistic literary disciplines are as nonsensical as metaphysical works. The difference between an artist and a metaphysician is intention. He writes, It is in fact very rare for a literary artist to produce sentences which have no literal meaning, and where this does occur, the sentences are carefully chosen for the rhythm and balance. If the author writes nonsense, it is because he considers it most suitable for bringing about the effects for which his writing is designed. The metaphysician, on the other hand, does not intend to write nonsense. He lapses into it through being deceived by grammar or through committing errors of reasoning. So the difference here is that literary artists use nonsensical statements to produce a specific effect in their writing, knowing full well that the statement is nonsensical. Metaphysicians, too, produce statements that are nonsensical, but they are unaware of this and intend the statements to be viewed as true. What Ayer ultimately wants us to realize is that metaphysical statements are literally meaningless due to their unverifiable nature. 
Many of the traditional problems in philosophy are comprised of these kinds of statements, and if we look upon them as being meaningless, we can disregard them and focus our attention on other matters pertaining to the acquisition of knowledge.